Okay, so now we're doing chapter 15. I'm in lab, as you guys can see. A little drawing, you have to see this. You see, this is my cookie. It says, eat gobble gobble tofu. <laughs> I'm so funny like that. Okay, so chapter 15. This is going to be talking about adaptive specific Im immunity and immunization. So again, since we're in the middle of COVID and they're coming up with a COVID vaccine, again, very applicable to current day topics. So the specific immunity is the adaptive line of defense. So the third line of defense we talked about uh, first and second in the last video, the third line is going to be acquired. And this is a dual system of both B and T lymphocytes. And this is immunocompetence. Okay. And so we have an antigen. And this is a molecule that stimulates uh, a response by both the T and the B cells. And there are two features that characterize specific immunity. One is specificity, and this is where the antibodies are produced. They function only against the antigen that they were produced in response to. And also there are memory um, cells, and these ones are lymphocytes that are programmed to recall their first encounter with an antigen and respond rapidly to subsequent encounters. So when we talk about lymphocyte origins, um, you can see here that um, there is a fun little cycle of what is going on. I'm trying to find it in your book, and I am not seeing it. So anyway, we'll check and see how good my eyeballs are. Okay, so basically here, uh, the stem cells in the red, bo red bone marrow give rise to the lymphocyte precursor, and then um, in two, some lymphocyte precursors are processed in the thymus to become those T cells where three, some lymphocyte precursors are processed within the bone marrow to become B cells. And then they can come together and both B cells and T cells are transported through the blood to the lymphatic organs, such as the lymph nodes and the spleen. So looking at T cells in the cellular immune response, a lymphocyte must be activated before it can respond to an antigen. The T cell activation requires antigen presenting cells or accessory cells, and these can include macrophages, B cells, and several other types of different cells. This requires major histocompatibility complex, which is abbreviated MHC, or human like leukocyte antigens, which are HLA, to recognize the non-self cells. The T cells can then synthesize or make and secrete polypeptides or special proteins that are called cytokines. The types of these T cells include helper T cells, cytotoxic T cells, and memory T cells. Um, specifically talking about B cells and the humoral immune response, well, B cells can be activated when the antigen fits in the shape of its receptor. Most of the time, B cell activation requires T cells, and these T cells are going to release cytokines that are going to, in turn, stimulate those B cells. Well, some B cells can become memory B cells, while others are going to be able to differentiate into plasma cells and therefore produce and secrete large globular proteins that are called antibodies or immunoglobulins. So here is a fun little diagram picture. Um, man alive. I don't know, not in the book that I have. I have to do this at home instead of at work. Okay, so anyway, you can see this is kind of like figure 1.15.3. Okay, but what we have here is the B cells combined with the antigen, and then the macrophage is going to display that digested antigen on its surface. And then what's going to happen is those cytotoxic T cells can um, contract uh, the displayed antigen. Those helper T cells are going to contact the displayed antigen, and then it's going to proliferate, which is a fancy word for grow. And then in four, the activated helper T cells are going to interact with B cells, which were combined with an identical, an identical antigen, and then they're going to be able to release cytokines, which then activate the B cells. Um, and the activated helper T cells then are going to interact with the cytotoxic T cells, which has combined with an identical antigen, and it then together releases interleukin-2, which then activates the cytotoxic T cell. And then over here in 5, the proliferation or growth and differentiation into either the T cell, um, the memory T cell, or the cytotoxic T cell. And so again, you can kind of see um, this is a little bit closer up of these. So you can see the antigen, the antigen receptor combination, the antibody, the cytokines, how they can grow or proliferate, clone each other, and then they proliferate and differentiate into either the plasma cells, which are the antibody secreting cells, or the memory cells, or the B cells can 
um, proliferate and differentiate into the plasma cells. Again, the antibody secreting and the memory dormant cells. So basically, there's the clone. So both of these are going to be the same. It's just they split and then they split again. So when we have the development of um, the immune response system, well, cell receptors are markers confer specificity and identity of a cell. There are major functions of receptors, and these are to perceive and attach to the non-self of two or foreign molecules. They can also promote the recognition of self molecules to then receive and transmit chemical messages among the other cells of the system. And these together aid in the cellular development. So this is um, talking specifically about the major histocompatibility complex, okay? And so basically, these receptors are going to be found on all cells except for red blood cells, okay? And so receptors are found, uh, I'm sorry, I just said that. And they are also known as human leukocyte antigens or HLA cells. And these play a role in recognition of self by the immune system and also therefore in the rejection of foreign tissues. So this is figure 15.2, and these show the molecules of the human major histocompatibility complex. And over here on the left, we have class 1 MHC molecules that are found on all nucleated human cells. And over here, we have class 2 MHCs, and these are found on some types of white blood cells. So um, again, those genes are for the MHC clustered. Um, they're clustered in a multi-gene complex, where class 1 are markers that display unique characteristics of self molecules and regulation of immune reactions. And these are required for T lymphocytes. We also have class 2, and these are regulatory receptors that are found on macrophages, those dendritic cells, and also beta cells, or B cells, I'm sorry. And these are involved in presenting the antigen to T cells. Specifically talking about lymphocyte receptors, lymphocytes' roles in surveillance and recognition is a function of their receptors. We have B cell receptors, and these bind free antigens. We also have T cell receptors, and these are going to bind processed antigens together with the, those MHC molecules on the cells that present the antigens to them. Talking about clonal selection theory. Well, lymphocytes use 500 genes to produce a tremendous variety of specific receptors. So they're very, very productive, right? Um, undifferentiated lymphocytes undergo a continuous series of divisions and genetic changes that generate millions of different cells. So they can go into lots of different things, right? And each cell has a particular or unique receptor specificity. And so this here would be the development of those lymphocytes, and this is figure 15.3. So basically, in the bone marrow, the lymphocytic cell, the stem cells differentiate either into T or B cells, and those B cells are going to stay in the bone marrow while those T cells migrate into the thymus, and both the T and B cells migrate to the secondary lymphoid tissue. And so you can see here in this picture, these are the major stages. So B cells are on the left where the bone marrow and stromal cells, right? So basically here is the release of the immature lymphocytes. Then they differentiate and mature into separate sites. So the B cells uh, mature in the bone marrow, the T cells uh, mature in the thymus. Hence T the expression of cell receptors occurs and then they migrate or move to the specific compartments of the lymphoid organs. So again, those beta cells and the, uh, God, I keep calling them beta cells, the B cells and the T cells, and then they can come together and converge in the lymph node. So what about lymphocytic or lymphocyte development? Well, lymphocyte specificity is pre-programmed. And so if this exists in the genetic makeup before an antigen has ever even entered the system. And this, these each can genetically be different um, for each type of lymphocyte. Okay, so this would be a clone. So each genetically different type of lymphocyte or clone re expresses a, ugh, ow, a single specificity. It just hit the binder and that kind of hurt. All right, so this is figure 15.4, and this is an overview of the clonal selection theory of lymphocyte development and diversity. So receptors are stylized to show that a diversity in shape and clonal selection generates. Um, and so you can also look at figure 15.5, which is coming up in two slides, to um, look at the details of the receptor development in B, B cells. And so basically up here in A, um, this is in step one. 
This is the antigen independent period. And so during development of early lymphocytes from the stem cells, a given stem cell undergoes rapid cell division to form numerous progeny or children, right? Um, during the early cell differentiation, there are random rearrangements of the genes that code for cell surface protein receptors. And the result is a large array of genetically distinct cells called clones. Each clone bears a different receptor to react with only a single type of foreign molecule or antigen. And then here in two, at this time, these are eliminated clones. So at this time, any lymphocyte clones that carry a specificity for self molecules and can be harmful are eliminated from the pool of diversity. And this is a way to achieve immune tolerance. And then down here in three, uh, the specificity for a single antigen molecule is programmed into the lymphocyte and is set for the life of a given clone. The end result is an enormous pool of mature but naive lymphocytes that are ready to further differentiate under the influence of their home organs and immune stimuli. Okay, so they're good to go and ready to um, get told what to do. Well, then in clonal section, uh, selection. This is the first introduced um, where each type of antigen is introduced to the immune system and it select, selects a genetically distinct lymphocyte. And so this causes it to expand into a clone of cells that can react to that antigen. So over here in um, B, then this is the antigen dependent period. And so this again is when the lymphocytes are going to migrate home to the lymphatic organs where they are situated to encounter the antigens. Entry of specific antigens select only the lymphocyte clone or the clones that carry matching surface receptors. And this will no longer trigger an immune response. Um, and this varies according to the type of lymphocyte that is um, involved. Okay, so again, that is figure 15.4. Um, this is figure 15.5, and this is specific B cell receptors talking about those immunoglobulins. So the receptor genes of B cells govern immunoglobulin or Ig synthesis. And immunoglobulins are large glycoproteins that serve as specific receptors of beta cell or <laughs> B cells. Sorry, I almost just swore, but I didn't. Gosh darn it. Okay, so um, here. You can see, oh, it's going to talk about it again right here. So this is composed of four polypeptide chains. There are two identical H chains or heavy chains, right? And then there are two identical light chains, and these are L chains. And the Y-shaped arrangements means that the ends of the forks are formed by the light and heavy chains, and they contain a wide range of vi variable or different antigen binding sites. And these variable regions, um, these are called variable regions and constant regions. And so um, going back to this one for a hot second, sorry. Um, so this again is figure 15.5 in your book. And this is a simple model of an immunoglobulin molecule. The main components are four polypeptide chains, two identical light and two identical heavy that are bound by that really strong disulfide bond as shown. So each chain consists of that variable and that constant region. Uh, C. The variable regions of light and heavy chains form a binding site for the antigen. So that was a summary. And then we go to part B of figure 15.5. And so this is where the final gene that codes for a heavier light chain is assembled by splicing box of genetic material from several regions 1, 2, and 3. And these genes are transcribed and translated into the polypeptides that join to form the final molecule. And so basically here, the immunoglobulin genes lie on those three different chromosomes. They're undifferentiated lymphocytes, and they have 150 different genes for the variable region of the light change and 250 variable regions for the diversity of the heavy chain. And so over here in one, you can see that the heavy chain genes are composed of four separate segments, the V, which is that orange color, the D, which is the blue color, the J, which is the green color, and the C, which is the um, I'm sorry, green, and then the C, which is the gray. And they are transcribed and translated, so they're made into RNA and then into proteins, right, um, to form the heavy polypeptide chains. Okay, um, and then in three, which is up here, this light chain genes are put together like heavy ones, except for the final gene is spliced in from three smaller gene groups. Okay, so you can see that these three, one, two, three, combine to make that light chain. And then down here in four, this is during the final assembly. The first, uh, first the heavy chains and the light chains are bound, and then the heavy light chain combinations are connected to form the immunoglobulin molecule. Okay, so it all works together to make a very uh, important protein. Okay, 
So during this development, the recombination causes only the selected V and D genes to be active in the mature cell. Once they're made, the immunoglobulin is going to be transported to that cell membrane so that it can be inserted there to act as a receptor. So what about T cell receptors for antigens? Well, these are formed by genetic recombination with variable and con uh, constant regions. And there are two peri ah, parallel polypeptide chains, and these are small and they are not secreted. So this is figure 15.6, and this is the structure of T cell receptors, which is again, uh, abbreviated TCR for antigen and CD receptors. The structure of the TCR is similar to that of immunoglobulin, it consists of two polypeptides that mimic the structure of one arm of immunoglobulin. The TCR has variable or V regions that you can see up here in this little loop-de-loop -loop, uh, that can show high levels of diversity for antigens and then constant, which are these little dudes, okay, so constant regions that do not uh, vary greatly. Another class of T cell receptors are called CD receptors and these function in cell signaling. The CD4 and CD8 receptors um, are going to be talked about coming up here. So what about B cell maturation? Well, basically, um, this is directed by bone marrow sites that harbor, harbor stromal cells, and these nurture the lymphocyte, uh, lymphocyte stem cells and provide hormonal signals. Millions of distinct B cells um, develop and home to specific sites in the lymph nodes, uh, the spleen and the galt. Okay. Um, they come into contact with antigens throughout life, and they have immunoglobulin as surface receptors for antigens. Um, so what about T cell maturation? Well, the maturation is directed by the thymus gland and its hormones. So the different classes of T cell receptors are termed CD or cluster of differentiation. There's CD4 and CD8. And then these mature T cells are going to migrate into lymph organs. So here is a fun little table um, here that is the con uh, contrasting properties of T and B cells. So this is table 15.1. It might be organized a little bit different uh, for you, but, but T cells are these guys, B cells are these ones. And it tells you the site is B for bone, T for thymus. Um, the markers are immunoglobulum MHC1 and MHC2, et cetera. So that's a fun little summary table for you. What about the entrance and processing of antigens and clonal selection? Well, antigen is a substance that provokes an immune response to specific uh, or in specific lymphocytes. Um, the properly or the property of behaving as an antigen is called antigenicity, and so this depends on foreignness, size, shape, and accessibility. So this is the first part of Figure 15.7, and it's the characteristics of antigens. So in A, which is this one, um, it says whole cells of bacteria, fungi, and viruses make good immunogens, and so do plant parts and animal cells. Um, then this would be part B and C of that picture, which is 15.7. And so perceived as foreign, not normal constituent of the body. Basically, this happens when foreign cells in large complex molecules, molecules over 10,000 uh, molecular weights are more most antigenic. An antigen, um, antigenic determinant or an epitope is a small molecular group that's recognized by those lymphocytes. And the antigen has many antigenic determinants. And so, again, in B here, the complex molecules, several epitopes make good immunogens, okay? And then, um, yeah, so that's that. And then um, down here in three, the polysaccharide, right? So there's poor immunogens that involve, include small, simple molecules that are not attached to the carrier molecule. So in one and two, and in larger molecules with repetitive chains and monomers that have been or that have reduced complexity. Okay, so again, that's figure point, uh, 5.7, 15.7. Oh, my Lord. Okay, haptins. These are small foreign molecules that consist only of a determinate group. Not, these are not antigenic unless they are attached to a larger carrier, and the carrier group contributes to the size of the complex, and it enhances the orientation of the antigen. Okay, so you can see here, this is figure um, 15.8, okay? And so this is the haptin uh, carrier phenomenon. And so basically in A, the haptins are antigens that are too small to be discovered by an animal's immune system, and so they therefore do not elicit a response. 
But in B, when the haptins bind to a large molecule, the haptin serves as an epitope and it stimulates a response in an antibody that's specific for it. So again, haptins are small foreign molecules that consist only of a determinant group. They're not anagenic unless they're attached to the larger carrier and the carrier group contributes to the size of the complex and it enhances the orientation of the antigen. Well, there are some special categories of antigens and these would be alloantigens, superantigens, allergens, and autoantigens. So alloantigens, these are cell surface markers and molecules that occur in some members of the same species, but not in others. There are superantigens, and these are potent T cell stimulators that can provoke an overwhelming response. There's an allergen, and this is an antigen that evokes an allergic reaction. And then there's an autoantigen, and this is a molecule um, on soft self tissue, sorry, for which tolerance is inadequate. Um, what about cooperation and immune reactions to antigens? Well, the basis for most immune responses is the encounter between the antigens and white blood cells. Um, the lymph nodes in the spleen concentrate the antigens, and then they circulate them around the body so that they will come into contact with the lymphocytes. So the lymphatic system is like your highway express to get these guys where they need to go. Um, antigen processing and presentation to lymphocytes. Well, the T site dependent antigens must be processed by phagocytes called antigen presenting cells or APCs. And APCs modify the antigen and then the AG, the antigen is moved into the APC surface and bound to the MHC receptors. Okay. And then the antigen presentation involves a direct collaboration between um, an APC and a T helper cells. So that's why they're helper cells, right? Um, interleukin-1, for instance, is secreted by APC, and this activates Th cells, where interleukin-2 is produced by Th to activate B cells and other T cells. So they're going to work together. So looking at this, this is figure 15.9. This is T cell, um, T helper activation. And so up here in 1, the APCs, which here is um, shown as a dendritic cell, um, they're found in large numbers in lymphatic tissues where they frequently encounter complex antigens such as microbes. The APCs um, engulf the microbes, take them into the intercellular vesicles, and then degrade them into the smaller, sim simpler peptides. Okay, And then in two, which you can see right here, the antigen peptides are complex with MHC2 receptors. And these are transported to the APC membranes, which is this little inset right there that you can see. Um, and from this surface, the location to the antigens are readily presented to a T helper cell, which is specific for the antigen being presented. Okay. And then down here, this is where this is going to become an activated T helper cell. It releases, interleukin, releases interleukins, and then it also assists with the activation of our, the other T cells and B cells. And then down here in three, which is there, with a glow up of that, you can see that the APC and T helper cells cooperate in the formation of receptor complex that triggers the T cell activation. First, the MHC2 antigen on the APC binds to the T cell receptor. Next, a co-receptor on the T cell, which in this case is CD4, hooks itself into a position on the MHC2 receptor. And this combination ensures that the simultaneous recognition of the antigen as non-self and the MHC receptor as self. These stimuli produce a signal that's relayed uh, to the T cell genetic material, therefore activating that um, T cell T helper cells. And then the activated T cells are going to be stimulated to release interleukins and to also assist other lymphocytes in their function. So again, this is um, figure 15.9. What about B cell responses? Well, B cell activation and antibody production. So once those B cells cross the antigen, they're going to interact with the Th cells, and then they're going to be stimulated to grow and differentiate um, by the different factors. Then they enter the cell cycle in preparation for mitosis and clonal expansion. These divisions give rise to the plasma cells that secrete antibodies and memory cells that can react to the same antigen later because they remember it and they know what to do. So with this guy, it's talking about B cell activation and differentiation. Okay, so this is figure 15.13 in your book. And so um, basically up here in one, the clonal selection and antigen binding. The B cells um, can independently recognize the microbes. And the example here is going to be a virus. 
and their foreign antigens, and therefore they can bind them with their Ig receptors. This is how the initial selection of the antigen-specific B cell clone occurs. And then in two, which is right there, this antigen processing and presentation. So once the microbe is attached, the B cell endocytes it, so it basically eats it like a Pac-Man, and it processes it into smaller protein units, and it displays these on the MH2 complex, and this is similar to other APCs. This event readies the antigen for presentation to a specific TH cell. Down here in three, the BH or the B cell slash TH cell is going to cooperate and they are going to be able to recognize. So for most beta cell or B cells, I keep calling them beta cells, for most B cells to become functional, they must interact with the T helper cells that bear receptors for that antigen from the same microbes. So they're very specific, kind of like we talked about enzyme specificity. These are very specific. Um, this T cell may have been activated by APC um, in the past. Uh, the two cells engage in a link recognition in which the MHC2 receptor bearing antigen on the B cell binds to both the T cell antigen receptors and the CD4 molecule on the T cells. And so that would be this little guy right here. So in four, which is right here, this is where the B cell is activated. So the T cell gives off additional signals in the form of interleukins and B cell growth factors. The linked receptors and the chemical stimuli serve to activate the B cell. Such activation signals and um, signals in increase in cell metabolism, leading to cell enlargement, proliferation, and differentiation. Then down here in five, and therefore six, five six, this would be the clonal expansion of those memory cells. So those activated B cells undergo numerous mitotic divisions in which they expand the clone of cells bearing this specificity, and they produce memory cells and plasma cells. This memory cells are persistent with long-term cells that can react with the same antigen on future exposures. And then down here on seven, the plasma cells and antibody synthesis. This plasma cells are short-lived. They actively uh, secrete things, so they're active circulatory cells that synthesize and release antibodies. These antibodies, which specifically here is the IgM, have the same specificity as the Ig receptors, and they circulate in the fluid compartments of the body where they react with the same antigens and microbes that were shown in step one. Okay. So what about, we've been talking less about antibodies. So what about antibody structure and function? And so this is a close up of figure 15.14, okay? And so um, this would be uh, immunoglobulins and they have a large Y-shaped protein. They consist of four polypeptide chain, with two identical fragments, which are located or, um, labeled FAB, with ends that bind to a specific antigen. Okay, and the FC is going to bind to various cells and molecules of the immune system. Okay, so that's uh, basically the anatomy of that. And then what about antigen binding? Well, this is Figure 15.15. So the union of the antibody, which is AB. Okay. Um, an antigen, which is AG, is characterized by a certain degree of fit and is supported by multiple or a multitude of weak link linkages, especially hydrogen bonds and electrostatic electro, uh, attractions. A better fit, so for instance, um, antigen A versus antigen C, so you can see that this one's really tight and uh, snuggly, or this one, there's a lot of space there. Okay, this um, so A is going to provide greater. Uh, lymphocyte stimulation during the activation stage than C or obviously B because B is not even fitting in there. C is a poor fit. So this would be a good fit. So it's like a lock and key method, right? So when you have the right one, it's going to bind and do its thing. Um, so what about antibody antigen reactions, interactions? Well, principal antibody activity is to unite with the antigen, to call attention to or neutralize the antigen for which it was formed. So it's like our fighting system, right? We have opsonization, and this is a process of coating the microorganism or other particles with specific antibodies so they're more readily recognized by those phagocytes. So it's kind of like tagging them with fluorescent paint. We also have neutralization, and this is where antibodies fill the surface receptors on a virus or the active site of a microbial enzyme to prevent it from attaching. And so this is um, figure 15.16, which is basically the summary of antibody functions. And this is, um, you know, it just tells you whether or not it's tagged or opsonized or neutralized. Um, you have agglutination, so this is also a continuation of 15.16, and so agglutination is when the antibody aggregation causes cross-linking cells or particles to clump into large clumps. 
You can also have complement fixation, and this is the activation of the classical complement pathway, and this can result in the specific rupturing of cells in some viruses. You also have precipitation, and this is aggregation of particulate antigens. So if you think of like things that precipitate out in a solution, they like, you know, they precipitate, right? They clump together. And so then you can see them. What about these functions of the FC fragment? Well, FC fragments bind to the cells um, or macrophages uh, with neutrophils, eosinophils, mast cells, basophils, and lymphocytes. Okay. And so I'm trying to find this in your book. Certain antibodies have regions on the FC portion for fixing that complement, and the binding of FC may cause the release of cytokines. Okay, so this one does not look like it is in your book, but basically that is what it does. So what about these immunoglobulin classes? This is a summary. Um, in this book, it's 15.3. There it's 15.2. So um, it's in your book, though. So again, look for your words. Monomer is one. Dimer means two. Penta is you know, five. You know, so you can look for your keywords and then um, you can figure out by studying this table the different average length of um, life, molecular weight, percentage of total antibody in serum, etc. Um, so what about antibodies in serum? So if it is separated by electrophoresis, globulin separates into four different bands. You have your alpha, um, one, your alpha two, your beta, and your gamma. And so your alpha one, I'm sorry, so most of these are antibodies, and the uh, gamma is composed primarily of IgG, uh, beta and alpha 2 are a mixture of IgG, IgA, and IgM. So this is the total serum and then the constituents of. So what about this primary response to an antigen? Well, the primary response is after the first exposure to an antigen, the immune system produces IgM and gradual increases in the antibody titer. And the titer is just a fancy word for concentration of the antibodies. And this um, is with the production of IgG. So this is figure 15.17, and this is showing you um, the primary response. So we have a first exposure. We have a latent period with no measurable antibody that's going to occur in early on. And then the first antibody appears as IgM. And then followed later, this is IgG that's arising from the activation of the first memory cells. So within weeks, the titer tapers back to low levels. Your secondary response then is going to be after the second contact with the same antigen, the immune system produces more rapid, stronger response due to memory smells. <laughs> smells. Cells. Um, so this is the amnestetic response. And so basically, the secondary response is a latent period is lacking because the other, uh, the other memory lymphocytes from the earlier response, they're ready to charge. And they're immediately ready to act. So the rapid rise in antibody titers, mainly of IgG, is going to be sustained for several weeks. Okay, And then the smaller amount of IgM is also produced by na uh, naive or new beta cells. Okay, but basically we're ready to fight. We hit you with all the punches to, um, you know, make it go away, right? Um, so what about uh, monoclonal antibodies? Well, these are going to originate from a single clone, um, and they have a single sp uh, specificity for an antigen. This is a pure preparation of the antibody. It's a single specificity. Um, of antibodies that are formed by fusing a mouse beta cell with cancer cells, and then this is used in diagnosis of disease, identification of microbes, and therapies. So I used to do Western blots and ELISA. Uh, monoclonal antibodies were more expensive because they are pure, but they give you a lot better result. So this here is um, going to be, uh, it's figure 15, it's making connections 15.1. So basically what happens here is, um, a mouse is going to be inoculated with an antigen, having the desired specificity, and then the activated plasma cells are isolated in its spleen, from its spleen. By myeloma cells are cultured from a different mouse that has, for instance, this cancer. Okay, And then down here, um, the two cell populations are mixed with polyethylene glycol, which then causes some of the cells in the mixtures to fuse and forward, form hydro hybromas. And then here, we, the surviving cells are going to be cultured and separated into individual wells, and tests are performed on each hybrodema. 
I, ah, to determine the specificity of the antibody it secretes. And then down here, we have the hybridoma is going to be maintained in a susceptible mouse for future use. And the hybridoma, with the desired specificity, is going to be grown in cell cultures and antibodies are produced and isolated until it is purified. So um, basically, these are selected microbial antibody-based drugs. Um, this, again, is figure 15.A. And so you can see um, different um, cancer drugs or other drugs and what they're used for. So non hodgkins lymphoma, acute myel myelogenous leukemia, Crohn's disease, uh, asthma, and RSV, right? So we use these a lot. Um, so T cells and mediated immunity. Well, the cell mediated immunity requires the direct involvement of T lymphocytes. Those T cells act directly against the antigen and the foreign cells when they're presented and associated with the MHC carrier. The T cells secrete cytokines that act on other cells, and then these sensitized T cells are going to proliferate or grow into long-lasting memory T cells. So there are a couple different types of T cells. There are T helper cells, which are CD4 or TH. And these are most prevalent, um, this is the most prevalent type of T cells. They help to regulate immune reactions to antigens, including other T and B cells. And they are also involved in activating macrophages and increasing phagocytosis. Um, they differentiate into um, helper, T helper 1, which would be Th1 cells, or T helper 2, which are Th2 cells. You also have cytotoxic T cells, and these are CD8 or TC. And these are going to destroy foreign or abnormal cells by secreting pre uh, preferens that lice or break apart those cells. You also have natural killer cells, and these lack specificity, and they circulate through the spleen, blood, and the lungs. So this is a fun picture of T cell differentiation. Um, so you can see what happens here and how they differentiate. Um, we have this in your book. Starfish guy. Okay, so basically you can um, you know read what's going to be going on here because it does not. Oh, there it is. This is figure five, fifteen point ten. And so this is the overall scheme of T cell activation and differentiation into different types of T cells. Um, and so basically what you can see is that the antigen presenting cells or the APCs are going to present antigenic properties to T cells bearing either the CD four, which is an A. Um, or CD8, which is B markers. And then up here in A is right here. The CD4 cells bind to the antigen. The MHC2 complexes on the APCs. And depending on the type of cytokine released from the APC, they're either going to become Th1 or Th2 cells. The Th1 cells then synthesize IL2 and interleukin 2 which then activates those CD8 cells and causes macrophages to destroy the ingested microbes or to become more cytoactive. Um, the Th2 cells are going to be secreting cytokines that enhance B cell activation. And then down here in B, this is upon binding of the antigen MHC1 complex, the CD8 cells become cytotoxic cells, which bind the infected host cells displaying antigen or MHC1 complexes and release porphyrins and granzymes. These lead to the apoptosis, which is um, programmed cell death, death and, uh, of the infected cells. Okay. So again, that is summarized in figure 15.10. Um, Sorry, I need to crack my neck. Okay, um, what about cytotoxic T cell activity? Well, this is in figure 15.11. So on the left, these are T cells. T cells recognize and bind to a cancer cells, which then they perf uh, perforate with many small holes. So they puncture it with holes. And then the um, cancer cells collapse and die by apoptosis or that programmed cell death, death. And then the T cell remains alive and active so they can be reused. Um, with T cells in superantigens, the reaction has drastic consequences. Superantigens are a form of a virulence factor, and these provoke overwhelming immune responses by a large number of T cells. These are going to release the cytokines, um, as well as uh, cause blood vessel damage, can potentially cause toxic shock, and multi-organ damage. So how do we classify these guys? Well, active immunity results when a person is challenged with an antigen that stimulates the production of antibody, therefore creating memories. It, this can take time, and it is long-lasting. 
We also have passive immunity, and this is um, where performed antibodies are donated to an individual, and it does not create a memory. It acts immediately, and it is short-term. We also have natural immunity, and this is acquired as part of normal life experiences. And then finally, we have artificial immunity, and this is acquired through medical procedures such as vaccinations. So with categories of acquired um, immunities, again, you can see here there's a nice little table of having them split out. So we have acquired uh, versus um, natural okay, and um, artificial. So this is just a nice, I saw this figure, where is it? So um, this one is figure 15.18. So natural immunities, which occur during the normal life uh, course, are either active or acquired or passive. So basically, your active immunity here is a consequence of when a person develops their own immune response to a microbe through infection. Passive immunity results when a person receives the performed immunity through the placenta or through nursing. Active immunity, this is the same as vaccination. And this results when a person develops his or her own immune response to a prepared microbial antigen. Then we have passive immunity, and this results when the person is given um, the selected immune substances that are made by another individual. Okay, so again, that's figure 15.18. Um, so the passive immunity, again, is immune serum globulin, or ISG, gammaglobulin, and this contains immunoglobulin that's extracted from pooled blood, and this would be used in immunotherapy. This is a treatment of choice in preventing measles, hepatitis A, and also replacing antibodies in immunodeficient patients. This sera is going to be produced in horses, and they can be available for diphtheria, botulism, spider, and snake bites, so a lot of different things. It acts immediately and it protects you for about two to three months. Okay. Um, vaccination, this is going to be artificial active immunity. And this, so this is deliberately exposing a person to the material that is antigenic but not pathogenic. So the principle is to stimulate a primary and a secondary amnesic response to prepare the immune system for future exposure to the virulent pathogen. And so it can react quicker and fight it off because it's seen it before. The response to a future Exposure will therefore be immediate, powerful, and sustained. Um, most vaccines are prepared from killed whole cells or inactivated viruses. They are live, um, attenuated cells or viruses. They can also be antigenic molecules that are derived from bacterial cells or viruses, and they can be genetically engineered microbes or microbial agents. So this is a fun little table of the checklists of requirements for an effective vaccine. Okay, and so especially since we're in the middle of COVID and they're developing vaccinations, this is um, kind of really pertinent, right? So you can see this again in my, this version of the book is 15.4. Uh, so it should have a low level of adverse side effects or toxicity and not cause serious harm. It should protect against exposure to natural wild forms of the pathogen. It should stimulate both the antibody B cells response as well as cell mediated T cell responses. It should have long-term lasting effects therefore producing memory, should not require numerous doses or boosters, and it should be inexpensive and have a relatively long shelf life and be easy to administer. So what about killed or inactivated vi viruses? Well, if we are, um, let's see, culturing, or we cultivate the desired, the di desired strain, we're gonna treat it with formalin or another agent that's going to kill off the agent, but it does not destroy the antigenicity. This often can require a larger dose and more um, boosters to become effective. And this is figure 15.17. And so basically the whole cells are, or viruses are killed and attenuated. And so um, they're killed and then they're dead, but they still can use their antigenic uh, properties. And then the vaccine is gonna stimulate the immunity, but the pathogen cannot multiply. Um, the second one is live attenuated cells or viruses, and these um, process the sustainability, uh, uh, no, substantially lessens. <laughs> this is the process that substantially lessens or negates the virulence of the viruses or bacteria, and this is going to eliminate those virulence factors. So basically, you have a live cell, you um, make sure that it's not going to be virulent anymore, it's still alive with antigens, you administer it, and then the microbes can multiply and boost the immune stimulation, but it can't um, be viral. Okay.
Um, the advantages of live preparations are that organisms can multiply and produce infection, but not a disease, just like the natural organism. They confer long-lasting protection, and they usually require fewer doses and boosters. Disadvantages include that they may require special storage, they can potentially be transmitted to other people, and they can conceivably mutate back to the virulent strain. Um, anagenic molecules, which are acellular or subcellular vaccines, or a subunit if it's a virus, um, these are exact anagenic uh, determinants that can be used when it's known um, the capsules, like for instance, pneumococcus and meningococcus, uh, if it, that it's a surface proteins like anthrax or hepatitis B, um, exotoxins such as diphtheria and ten, uh, tenitis, that's not how you pronounce that, tetanus. All right, and then antigen can also be taken from the cultures and produced by uh, genetic engineering or synthesized. So this again is gonna be in figure 15.19 and this is vaccines from microbe parts. So basically um, you're gonna submit the vaccine uh, or the virus, okay? And then you have an acellular vaccine, which is the bacterium, and it is going to be used to uh, isolate antigen molecules used for the vaccine. And there's no intact pathogen that's present. Here you have the genetically engineered vaccines, and these are where we can insert genes for the pathogen's antigen into the plasmid vector, and this, and then therefore clone them into the appropriate host. So the stimulated clone hosts to synthesize and secrete a protein product or an antigen, and then harvest and purify the protein um, like they do in hepatitis. So um, a little subset is the Trojan horse vaccine. So this is where we have a genetic material other um, or from a pathogen that's going to be inserted into a live carrier non-pathogen, then the recombination or the recombinant expresses the foreign genes. And so right now we're in experimental phases for vaccines for AIDS, herpes, simplex 2, leprosy, and TB using this. Um, a couple of last slides. We have the genetically engineered uh, vaccines, and these are DNA vaccines, and these can create recombination by inserting microbial DNA into the plasmid vectors. Um, the human cells will pick up the plasmid and express it in microbial DNA as proteins, causing B and T cells both to respond, therefore be sensitized, and therefore form memory cells. Um, again, there's experimental vaccines in the works for using this for Lyme disease, hepatitis C, herpes, simplex, influenza, TB, and malaria. And so um, you can see the uh, steps there. Let's see if we can find this. So this is figure 15.20. And so the DNA vaccination, um, yeah, so basically the DNA that codes for the uh, protein antigen is extracted from the pathogen genome. The genomic DNA is inserted into a plasma vector, and then the plasma is amplified and prepared as a vaccine. And then the DNA vaccine is injected into the, stom the stomach, the subject, and then the cells of the subject are accepted in plasma with the pathogen's DNA. The DNA is transcribed and translated into various proteins. And then from there, the foreign protein of pathogen is inserted into the cell membrane, okay? And this is where it will stimulate that immune response. All right, so what about the route of administration and side effects? Well, most admi are administered by injection. There are a few oral and there are a few nasal. Some vaccines require an adjuvant um, to enhance or the immunogenicity or prolong the retention of the antigen. And these stringent requirements are also in place for the development of, of the protein. We're doing that right now with the COVID vaccine. Um, there's more benefit than risk. So the benefit far outweighs the risk of potentially getting something uh, sick from a vaccine, right? And some of these side effects can include local reaction at the injection site, fever, allergies. Um, very rarely they have back mutation into a virulent strain of whatever you got vaccinated for. And there can be some neurologic effects, but usually that's um, very, very, very rare. All right, and then last slide, herd immunity. This is where immune individuals will not harbor it, harbor it, therefore reducing the occurrence of pathogens. And this is known as herd immunity. And it is less, li less likely that non-immunized people will encounter a pathogen because if nobody has it, then potentially they wouldn't be exposed. Controversial, this herd immunity. All right, so thanks for coming. Thanks, guys.